two readings today. Um, the first reading is from John chapter 13, verses 2 to 5. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Issachariah, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything, and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. And from John chapter 14, verses 1 to 10. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my Father's house. If this were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you, so that you will always be with me where I am, and you will know the way to where I am going. No, we don't know, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus replied, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. This is the word of the Lord. Oh, good morning, everyone. That was very nice. That was like, I used to be a teacher. You guys sounded like a classroom of students. Well done. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here with you today for a, an extended period of time to be sharing with you. Hopefully you're not sick of me by the end of uh, today. Um, but I'm really, I feel privileged and honoured to be with your church during this season of transition. I, I recognise it's a important season and so thank you so much for making me feel so welcome and in, and inviting me into this season uh, with you guys. This morning what I want to share with you is really a found, foundational piece that I'll go on to, to talk more about uh, later this afternoon in the workshop and it's also a foundational piece for this whole um, idea and theme that we're talking about, about living as scattered servants. I recognize that it's also a very big topic that I can't cover it all uh, in this one sermon today. Um, but I'm really just going to trust that the Holy Spirit will speak to you individually through what I share and that he will continue on the journey with you um, past today. At the end of my message, I am going to ask you guys to respond. Respond to what the Holy Spirit is placing on your heart. So why don't we right now take a moment to set our hearts before the Lord. I'm recognizing more and more in my days <laughs> that it's so easily to walk through my day and not even recognize God's presence with me. Even in our Sunday services, we, we know what we're doing. We go from this thing to the next thing and we can forget to stop and just marvel in the wonder that the presence of God is here with us today. So let's take a moment to just fix our eyes, our attention and our affection upon him. Father, I thank you for your promise to us that you will be with us always. So we acknowledge your presence in this place. We 
we recognize that it is a, that is a privilege that was not given to us because we have done anything to earn it. But because of your goodness. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would simply speak to each individual heart here and that you would reveal Jesus to us today. Jesus, we exalt you above every other distraction, every other thing we've got going on in our life, every other person. Jesus, you are Lord. Oh, man. I realize that you guys don't know me very well, so I'm going to share a bit of my story with you today, uh, mainly in regards to my, my father, my dad. I had a really good dad. I had a good dad in the sense that he brought uh, me and my siblings up in a really nice home. Uh, he made sure that we had everything that we needed. We had more than enough food. We fought over chocolate. Uh, we had every opportunity given to us. I had a good dad. I had a great dad in the sense that both he and my mum, uh, from the moment I was born, uh, took us along to church services. They prayed with us before we fell asleep at night. Uh, and... My dad particularly had a great passion for this thing, for this book. And he instilled that passion for the Word of God in me. And I'll be forever thankful for that. But I didn't have a perfect dad. On February 14th, 2006, I got a call from my mum early in the morning to say, uh, to come to come home, I was living down in Mandra at the time, and to come home, and that my dad uh, wants to speak to me. And my dad had been away for work, as he often was, um, so he had just come home. So I get there, I sit at the table with my dad, and he goes on to tell me that he has been in relationship with another woman for many months that he doesn't love my mum anymore and that he and my mum will be separating. In that moment, it felt like my whole world fell apart. I had very much looked up to my dad. He was my hero. Everyone had told me that you are just like your father. <laughs> My family was a family that I was extremely proud of. And in this moment, it was like everything changed. That conversation was quite a long conversation and I don't remember a whole heap about it. But there was one particular thing that my dad said that has stuck with me. And he said, Kaya, you and your, your my, I've got an older sister and a, and a younger brother, you kids, you're all adults now. You don't need a father anymore. My first thing was like, Dad, my brother's, he's 17 years old. He's still in high school. And, and up to which my dad's response was, oh, yeah, I was hoping that, Everyone wouldn't find out until a year, year's time. And I was like, great plan. <laughs> You're all adults now. You don't need a father anymore. And I had spent my whole life listening to my dad and his wisdom. <laughs> so part of me was like, oh, okay, I need to listen to that. But there was something in my heart that knew that that wasn't true that I needed a father. And as I've been on this journey since that time, 
I've learned it doesn't matter what age we are, we need a father. That God has designed us to need a father in our life. If we look at the whole biblical narrative from the very beginning, God created Adam and Eve, humankind, to be and to live in unbroken fellowship with him. Think about it. They got to walk with God, it says in the cool of the day. They walked around naked, <laughs> unashamed, in complete oneness with God. And it wasn't until Adam and Eve were tempted to live independently from God, to go their own way, to not follow in the ways that God had said that sin entered and that brokenness occurred. And from that moment, if we go through the biblical story, God chooses a group of people, the Israelites, to display his nature and his character to, trying to draw them back into that fellowship with him. And the Israelites continually wanted to try and live independently of God. So we know Jesus ends up coming. Father God sends Jesus in the very likenesses of him, so that we could see and touch God in human form. Jesus goes on to display the Father's heart to everyone that he meets, and he shares the story of the prodigal son, which is, I think, a highlight of it, of where he has a son who runs away, wanting to live independently, only to come back around and we see the father there with open arms welcoming him back home. The pinnacle of the story is Jesus going to the cross to pay that penalty for our sin. And I love in that whole story of the crucifixion how the veil of the temple that separated the presence of God from the people was torn in two. And that now his spirit was released so that fellowship could happen again with all people. And then if we fast forward to the end of the book, <laughs> what picture do we have? Man living in unbroken fellowship with God again, our ultimate destiny. This is the Father's heart. Not that we would one day grow up and no longer need a father anymore. But that we would live constantly in unbroken fellowship with him. I want to take a look at that passage in John 13 that was read. And I know that Luke went into detail of this last week beautifully. Um, but I just want to pull a part out of here in regards to the father. It says, It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured it poured the water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. Jesus knew. He knew about the road of suffering that was about to take place. He knew the torture he would endure. He knew the cross that he was about to go to. He also knew that one of his closest friends, who he had brought into his inner circle, who he had shared the secrets of the kingdom with, who he had loved to the end, was about to betray him. And yet, Jesus still humbled himself, got down, served Judas, and washed his feet. How? I don't think I'm the only one that's ever been betrayed <laughs> in this room. How hard is it to love and serve someone that's betrayed you? Jesus knew in advance that this was about to happen and the torture that would come after it, and yet he still washed his feet. 
how? This is mind-boggling. And yet I see in this passage where that power or that empowerment or that, that grace came from. It says that Jesus knew he had firstly come from God. He knew who he was. More importantly, he knew whose he was. He had come from God. He knew his identity. Secondly, it says that he would return. He knew he would return to God. That ultimately he was going back to the Father. He knew his destiny. It says that he knew that the Father had given him all authority to endure what he was about to do. He knew his purpose and he knew his assignment. Out of this knowing, he was able to serve and to love. Even in the midst of the pain and discomfort. What I think is somewhat sad about our culture and our society is that we have reduced fathering to being a provider and to providing security. Those are important, extremely important roles of the father. But I think if we think of it only in those terms, then we can do what my dad did and said, I've done my part. I provided for you. I protected you. Now you're on your own. But the father's role is so much bigger than that. And we see that in this passage and we see it throughout the biblical narrative. That the key to the role of the Father is these four things. One, to help us to understand who we are, our identity. Secondly, to help us to come to know our purpose, why we're here on this earth. Thirdly, to to remind us of where we're going, our destiny. And fourthly, to help us to discover our unique assignment here on earth. That's the role of the Father. And if we don't end up receiving that from our fathers, then do you know what we end up doing? We go looking for it in every other thing. We go looking for it in substance abuse, drugs, alcohol, addictions, We go looking for it in performance, in striving, in the things that we're good at. Or we go looking for it in unhealthy relationships. And this was part of my story. For 30 years of my life, I feel like I was wandering around, completely lost, not knowing who I was. Did I know Jesus? Yes. Did I know the word of God? Yes. But I had no idea who I was or what, or, what, or what God thought or designed me to be. So I was lost. It wasn't until when uh, in my 30s that God started to surround me with healthy spiritual mothers and fathers who brought me in close to them, began to walk with me began to see from the Father who I was and declare that over me and help me become who they saw the Father made me to be. Help me through the journey of forgiveness towards my, my earthly dad and began speaking me back into life. I always wonder what my life would be like if that hadn't happened, if I hadn't had those people We live today in the most fatherless generation of all time. And by fatherlessness, I mean that the kids are growing up without a father in the home. Or the father is away more with work than they are at home. Our prison system statistics tell us that... (coughs) I can't remember the exact number, but it's over 80% of those in prison come from her fatherless homes. 
we wonder why our world's going crazy. Why is it they are, that people are this whole wokeness thing? Everyone deep down is looking to be seen, to be known, to be loved, to be celebrated. Everyone is looking for a place to belong, to feel safe. Everyone is looking for a home, a place where their soul can rest. And the tough question that I felt the Holy Spirit asked me was, Kaya, will they find that in you? When people meet me, when I'm hanging out with people, do they see the Father's heart for them? Or are they encountering a wall? A wall of criticism, a wall of judgment, a wall of expectations that say, you have to be like this before I'm going to love, accept you and celebrate you. I feel like this is the invitation for the church in this season to a generation of orphans. Are we going to live as scattered servants carrying the Father's heart? How do we do that? In John 14, Jesus says, If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. There's that unbroken fellowship. They're completely one. Jesus says, I don't say anything that I don't hear the Father saying. I don't do anything. The works I do is through the Father. The oneness there. Says that we can only see the Father if we see through Jesus. Do you know what's also crazy? The Father sees us through Jesus. Not through our brokenness, <laughs> not through our sin. He sees us through Jesus. So that makes me think, how do I see others? When I look at other people, am I putting on a darkened lens? of the world, a lens of criticism, a lens that has been tainted by my own brokenness and my own unforgiveness and bitterness and woundedness. And am I seeing people through that and saying, you're not good enough? Or the other choice is to put on the eyes of Jesus that is pure, <laughs> washed clean in the blood of Jesus, and to see them through the eyes of Jesus, who takes the hard road of bringing people close to himself as they are, begins to walk with them, expressing the Father's heart to them, helping them to see who they are and who the Father created them to be and then helps to release them to become who they are. Which glasses do you want to wear? Will we become those that carry the Father's hearts to others? Will we become those arms that embrace people? Will we become the mouths that speak blessing? Will we become the hearts that love unconditionally? Will we become the ones that proclaim welcome home? What's crazy is that was the very thing that the Pharisees mocked Jesus for. 
why they concluded that he's not the Messiah because he sits and eats with sinners. Though he's not good enough yet. That's the religious spirit. The Father's heart is one of, you are welcome here. Welcome home. Would you stand with me? We have all got our own stories. We've all got our own experiences of, of Father God and our earthly fathers. So my belief is that you're all going to respond differently to what the Holy Spirit is putting on your heart right now. But I wonder if you would just ask him, Father, what are you wanting me to see today? Maybe you're feeling the call to become a father and mother to a world of orphans. Maybe there's a place of repentance for how we've judged and criticized others and for the lens that we've been seeing people through. Or maybe you're desiring to know what the Father thinks of you. Maybe for the very first time, you're feeling the Father calling to you, saying, come home. Come home. Father, I thank you that there are more than enough rooms in your house for every single one of us. That your heart is that all your children would come home. Lord, I pray that we would become your hands and feet, but most of all that we would become your heart your message. Of a father who longs to live in unbroken fellowship with his children. 